the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day. It's Thursday, April 14th. Here are the top market stories we're following for you at this hour. Musk's Twitter bid. Elon Musk offers to buy Twitter and take it private in a deal that values a social media company at $43 billion. Share soaring as Twitter reviews the offer. And the ECB sticking to its plan. The European Central Bank is sticking to the plan to end its bond buying program in the third quarter, even as the war in Ukraine fans inflation. We're going to discuss the international implications with IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva. Banks, they beat big. Wall Street's biggest banks posting first quarter results with trading revenue driving enormous earning beats. We're going to break it all down for you. From New York, I'm Kriti Gupta with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, a fascinating morning, which was supposed to be very quiet going into the long weekend in the United States and Europe, really coming out with <laughs> yeah. a lot of breaking news on the eco front, on the ECB front, and of course on the Twitter front. I can't quite work out if you if you took today off to try and get ahead of the traffic, basically, are you a genius or did you fail massively? <laughs> because as you say, a lot of things have happened this morning and a lot of things have been turned on their head. Uh, you got the euro crashing, you got this Twitter bid, you got Williams talking about 50 basis point hikes, you got the data hitting the Bloomberg terminal. Let's talk about that now and figure out what is going on. I'm a little surprised by these numbers. So we get the University of Michigan uh, sentiment index. It, 59.4, the last number. We go to 65.7. I'm, I'm trying to work out why. Uh, current conditions, 68.1, up from 67.2. Um, and the expectations index, this is where things have really changed. The expectations index has gone from 54.3 to 64.1. Like, I saw this number hit the tape, and I'm like, is that a typo? Because the prior number was 53.6. The inflation numbers stay elevated but are below expectations. The expectations was that the one-year inflation number in terms of the survey, given where gas prices are, though they are starting to track down a little bit, um, would come through at 5.6. It's coming through at 5.4, which is basically static to where we were last time. I, I, I'm still trying to get my arms and my brain, to be honest, around that, that expectations number. 64.1 is what we get there. We'll come back. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. The other story, obviously, we've got to focus on is what is happening with Twitter. I'm not massively surprised by this. I think a number of people probably aren't. After he decided not to take the board seat, he was obviously ruminating on other options. So Twitter says it will review Elon Musk's $43 billion offer to take the company private. The world's richest uh, person says that the company has extraordinary potential and he apparently is the person to unlock it. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Ed, first of all, I want to deal with the mechanics of this. Right. How does an individual pay this much money for a company? Does he just write a check? How does it work? Yeah, it, it, it's the question, right? And as with all the stories in the last few weeks on Elon Musk and Twitter, there are more questions than answers at this point. But $43 billion, $54.20 per share in cash. You know, I've spoken to a few on the buy side this morning that point out that um, a lot of Twitter's holdings are held by passive funds, you know, that use index products. And when is the last time in history you can recall, Guy, where an individual, not an institution or an entity, but an individual made an all-cash offer for $43 billion? And, you know, he said, Elon Musk said in the letter to Twitter's chairman and board, this was his final offer, no back and forth. But I would say that a number on the sell side point out this morning that it, we could see him increase that offer because, you know, a year ago, Twitter shares were much higher than they are now. Ed, what's interesting to me here is that the Elon Musk vision essentially for Twitter, a lot of it includes subscription bases. It also includes uh, perhaps targeting Twitter blue and some of the other kind of pieces of Twitter yeah. that they have actively been trying to monetize and just haven't been able to do it as, as aggressively. My question to you, though, is what happens if this offer doesn't go through? Is the expectation on the street that Twitter is still able to recover or with the Elon Musk bid and interest gone, do Twitter shares collapse? Yeah, look, it, it, the, the consistent line from Elon Musk across all of the regulatory filings that we've had in the last 10 days, two weeks, is 
the potential to be a platform for free speech. Free speech. Guy and I were talking about this on radio the other day. Elon Musk is fixated on free speech. And the background to this story is that when Jack Dorsey stepped down as Twitter CEO in the last week of November last year and Parag Agrawal became CEO, Elon Musk tweeted a meme. And the meme depicted Agrawal as Joseph Starling pushing his then head of security into a river. And the inference that was drawn at the time was... A, that Elon Musk wasn't a big fan of the new Twitter CEO, but B, there were some ideological differences. And, and by yeah. extension, what the street drew out from that was that there was a concern about content moderation on the platform. So you'd expect that to start. Ed, why is the stock trading at 47, not 54? <sighs> Sangu the market being sanguine, the market not jumping the gun. I mean... The other line, and sorry, I'm referring to the text of the letter that Elon Musk sent to Twitter, but he basically says that if the offer's not accepted, this is his best and final offer, if it's not accepted, I would need to reconsider my position as a shareholder. You know, it seems like every possible outcome is still on the table. This is the problem with the situation, that we're going on the wording of the regulatory filing. He says this is his final offer. What if he makes another offer? What if the board rejects? Um, what role is the SEC going to play in this? I realise th these are all questions, Guy and, and Critty, not answers. Um, but but this, is, this is the problem with, with, with how Elon Musk operates. And if you read across the sell side uh, notes that have come out very quickly this morning, everyone's split. Dan Ives of Wedbush thinks this will go through. It's going to happen. Others think that he's lowballing the price, that he will come back with a higher offer. Um, and others think that it just won't happen at all because of the complication of making the deal go through. Well, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, thank you so much. And of course, we know that Ed's going to be following the story, monitoring it throughout the rest of the day. Thank you for your time. Let's turn now to the other big story of the day, and that, of course, is the European Central Bank and its fight against inflation. President Christine Lagarde spoke to reporters after the ECB renewed a pledge to end bond buying in the third quarter. Price rises have become more widespread. Energy costs are pushing up prices across many sectors. Supply bottlenecks and the normalization of demand as the economy reopens also continue to put upward pressures on prices. Joining us now is Jens Eisenschmidt. It's his first TV interview since leaving the ECB for Morgan Stanley. He is now Morgan Stanley's chief European economist. We so appreciate you joining us today. Give us your takeaway of simply what we've heard. Going into this meeting, we know that the market was extremely hawkish. Now, this kind of commentary from the ECB and from Christine Lagarde, perhaps interpreted as a little bit more dovish than expected. Is that your read of the situation? Yeah, I mean, first of all, great to be here with you. Uh, and let me... Uh, first stressed that we were actually not surprised. So, I mean, essentially, the, today's outcome was as uh, also broadly by us expected, with one small tweak to that, but I will come to that in a second. So, first of all, they are sticking to uh, their script um, that they have basically announced in March, and as Christine Lagarde was also saying in the press conference, that actually dates back to December. So, the December was really the start of the, the you know, the end of the super accommodative monetary policy. So, in December, they announced the end to PEP. Uh, plus uh, some APP uh, envelope behind that until uh, October, uh, and then maybe some rate hikes in 23. In February, they were uh, jumping a little bit ahead, so we, we speed this process up, and because we have seen inflation surprising to the upside, so let's speed that process up and have maybe uh, an earlier end to this um, uh, APP and have tightening a little bit earlier, so not no longer ruling out any rate increases in 22. And in March, um, there was the war uh, as a new development. And at the same time, um, they have uh, said, OK, we have, we have seen additional inflation surprises to the upside. So what they then essentially said, OK, we will have guidance for Q2. Um, that's 40, 30, 20, which they uh, reiterated today. Uh, plus, yeah. we say we will, end, we will end in Q3. And then we will, we will see what, what happens to rates. And they said exactly the same. There's one small difference. And let me, let me underscore this, which is very important. Because what the market saw as, as dovish, actually, from the ECB's perspective, is hawkish. Basically, they said, instead of keeping it open and say, well, asset purchase net, asset purchases end in Q3 or, you know, could, could go thereafter, they basically said, now I think we are more certain than we were before that net asset purchases will end somewhere in Q3. The market has not taken sense, it yeah, that way. Yeah. Jens, the market's taken this as super dovish. 
Euro's trading 108, sub 108. Um, you, you've seen a big bid coming into BTPs today. Yields have come down really sharply. The market took today as dovish. Are you saying that the, the that Lagarde has miscommunicated? That actually this is a more hawkish statement that the market is saying that it is? No, I'm just saying that there are two sides to the coin, right? The market, I think, was getting a little bit ahead of itself, uh, pricing a July hike. I think that was not something that you could uh, essentially deduct from any communication coming out of the ECB. And I think they have been crystal clear on that. If anything, they have been recently uh, highlighting um, the risk to growth. And that could mean that also uh, APP may run yeah. for longer. And I think it's in a unique situation. And again, as, as President Lagarde was highlighting this in the press conference, there is an element here that separates the euro area from the US. It's a completely different economic setup, and they have this very huge risk, which is to the east. It's brewing, and you know they are more exposed than anybody else to that risk. And I think that essentially is growth is, the is biggest the risk now for the East. Jens, yeah, is growth the biggest risk for the ECB or inflation? So. Uh, I guess there is there, that's that's what, what makes it so difficult, right? I mean, I think they are in a situation they are faced with a shock that lowers growth and increases inflation. And I think it's just a question of magnitudes here in terms of what you think you have to act on. Now, I think, again, uh, President Lagarde made it clear in the press conference, they have to avoid a situation in which high inflation stays there for too long because at some point this starts to get ingrained in wage settings. So far, they haven't sounded the alarm bell there, but what they have been face, uh, stressing clearly is that there have been first signs of, you know, I would say uneasiness uh, by some policymakers, that's the way I would translate that, as to how long-term inflation expectations look like. So in some sense, I think they are, the name of the game is normalization, policy normalization. And what I read of today's, uh, what, what I read in today's decision is policy normalization won't be derailed unless growth comes in very, very negatively. Okay, Jens, we're going to leave it there. Great stuff. Thanks for jumping in. Really appreciate your analysis. Um, so recently, obviously, at the ECB, maybe better able to read between the lines as to what is happening here. Please come back. We look forward to hosting you once again. Jens Eisenschmidt, Morgan Stanley's chief European economist. Thank you very much indeed. Critty, the problem today is that they didn't talk about FX. You've got an FX story that is beginning to develop. Uh, we've got sub-108. The problem is that, that a lot of what... Europe's inflation problem is centred on is energy. Energy is priced in dollars. That energy just got more expensive as Christine Lagarde was speaking today. And I think the interpretation turned a little dovish because look at the phrasing that they use, confidence, trade numbers, and of course, to your point, the energy crisis. These are not necessarily the focus if you're talking about inflation necessarily. So instead of talking about supply the supply side, which really was the conversation a few months ago, they are very clearly looking at the demand side now. We'll see if they stick to that narrative. The other issue that we've got to think about as well is on what happens with Labour. The Labour story is much slower to develop in Europe, but once we start to see second round effects in the Labour market, gets much stickier. Anyway, coming up, central bankers and finance ministers from around the world uh, are gathering next week for the, uh, for the IMF's annual spring meetings. We have an exclusive interview with the IMF's managing director coming up next. Kristalina Gorgieva, next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio across America and indeed around the world. Not a usual interview at the International Monetary Fund. In these unusual times with the spring meetings in one week, we are out front with the first interview with Kristalina Gorgieva, the International Monetary Fund Managing Director. An extensive interview, and I've made clear to her if she wants to go longer, we'll let her go longer all morning. Uh, so much to talk about. Thank you so much for having us here. It's been a wonderful conversation uh, through the morning. I want to talk and go to a quote which I just spoke to Angela Sten about, the great author of Putin. This is Vladimir Putin in Russia two days ago, uh, an Associated Press translation, obviously for the Russian audience. The thing we do, on one hand, we help people saving them from Nazism. On the other hand, we take measures to ensure Russia's own security. You are more qualified than anyone. Your heritage of Bulgaria, your grandfather was a patriot of Bulgaria. You have lived under this Karl Marx University and such. You personally must be thunderstruck. And with members of the greater Gorgieva clan in Ukraine now, just for a moment, what has the last 50 days been like for you 
and your family? It has been horrific. A war is a terrible thing. For my family, what it means is threat to their safety, more difficult to find food and more expensive to buy it, no medicines, and above all, that sense that the war would not soon end. Getting out there in Kharkiv, in the eastern part of uh, Ukraine, is close to impossible. Why? They are very close to the Russian border and very far from the Polish uh, and other borders of Ukraine. But in this horror of war, what impressed me the most is the strength that they demonstrate for the future of Ukraine. My sister-in-law's message is, we will win this war. Can they do it alone? And the distinction of my interviews with the right and the left, the politically savvy and not, is this timidity about starting a World War III. Now, that's not your mm -hmm. mandate at IMF, but I would like you to comment on how you perceive the shock of the Western world mm -hmm. and their tentativeness in assisting not only Ukraine, but all of Eastern Europe, up, frankly, to mm -hmm. Finland. Well, the um, um, reality of this war is it is about Ukraine and it is beyond Ukraine. It is about Ukraine because its existence is being threatened, mm -hmm. but also the post-world order is being threatened. And in this sense, the war affects all of us. If we are to allow a 21st century military takeover of a country in Europe that is detrimental to Europe, it is detrimental to the world. And what we have to recognize that the war is having consequences reaching far and fast. It affects hundreds of millions of people through three main channels. Mm -hmm. One, commodity prices, especially food, energy, but also yes. metals. Mm -hmm. And food prices are up at the time they were pushed already up by bad harvest well, I in want many to talk, places. I want to talk about the food in a minute, and that's going to be the main part of our mm. conversation with what we see are the challenges of the IMF in helping Sri Lanka, Peru, and mm. others. But I, I, I want you to comment on the scope and scale we see. This is mm. something you're expert in academically. And another expert, Janet Yellen, who has mm. a little bit of experience with the mm. trillions word, says we're getting the magnitude right. Yellen says we need to think in trillions, not billions. Mm -hmm. As you go to your spring meetings and, frankly, to your October meetings, do we have the magnitude wrong of what is needed? Well, uh, Janet Yellen is right. We need trillions, and we have been talking about these trillions for years. How can we transform billions into trillions? Well... First, by all of us working together. We cannot have fragmented deployment of scarce development international finance resources. Two, by embracing a very simple principle. Public money should be used for only one of two things. To finance what private money would never finance and to remove barriers for private finance in emerging markets mm -hmm. and developing economies. And we are still short of embracing entirely this principle. At the IMF, our concentration is when we have a program in a country, is this program going to open up space for private sector-led growth, for jobs that come because vibrant investments are being made? 
-hmm. And when we, when we look at the countries that are now in difficulty, we are determined to have, help them have fundamentals that would make mm -hmm. that private sector-led growth possible. I want to talk about the mechanisms here and then get to the food crisis. Our Eric Martin is front and center on this and looking nation to nation mm -hmm. at where the greatest challenges are. The, 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 the nuance here is the solution domestically for these troubled nations in food is price control. Mm. To keep the price of bread down, to keep the price of wheat down, the price of rice down, etc. The IMF comes in and says, okay, you're broke, fine, let us help mm. you fix it. But there needs to be a new me mechanism mm. given the magnitude and the shock of this inflation. Mm. Explain the new mechanism or process you will use to move from domestic controls over to something that's more modern Western capitalist? How do, you, how do you get from A to B? We have been on this now for quite some time. And you're yes. right, we have to get uh, even faster on that path. And what we are working with countries to do is to have targeted assistance. Uh, so there is social protection that identifies who are the vulnerable that need to be helped. What is the problem with price controls? Everybody benefits from it. The rich benefit mm -hmm. and the poor. But if the country doesn't have a social safety net, if they don't know who their vulnerable families are, they are bound to go for price controls because that's the only thing they can do. And by the way, at this moment of time, in some circumstances, we would say, this is not your first best. It's not even your second best. But given the speed with which prices are jumping, right. there is some, some logic in making sure people don't go hungry. How do we think about this in the future? Uh, uh, we have two, two complementary strategies. One is what I just described. Mm -hmm. Target your, your public spending. For God's sake, don't throw good money in the direction of rich people. Second, think about food in a more sustainable manner. Remember, this year, food crisis has already been knocking on the door before the war because of climate change, because of climate shocks, because agriculture in Africa <coughs> okay. is rain-fed. You have no rain, you have no food. We have to think about sustainability and resilience in a more shock-prone world differently. Okay, but let's, I'm going to digress here, and I do want to come back to food. And folks, if you're just joining us on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, Kristalina Gorgieva, the IMF Managing Director here in a conversation, I can say in all my years of doing this, a critical point into the spring meetings of the IMF uh, next week. I want to digress here on climate change. I was at the Paris Accords mm -hmm. and the, the advancements that have been made. Tell me of the derailment of the need to burn coal. How temporary is that, or has there been a seismic shift for climate change? It is temporary. I don't see coal persisting for much longer. Why? Because one of the benefits, the silver lining, if you wish, of high energy prices is they make renewables more viable. And they inevitably you, would accelerate. You believe we'll see substitution oh, in yes, here to will. assist? Yes. How long would it take? I am not an okay. energy expert. I would not guess. Just, but the direction to travel is uh, clean energy. Okay, fine. Just because of time, I really want to mm. get all these issues in. We see Peru. We see Sri Lanka. Mm. We see Egypt, which is a mm -hmm. much larger, bigger problem. Yeah. That's the focus of our Eric Martin. If I see these different companies in maximum distress, mm. it alludes to the Arab Spring, to Tunisia, and mm. almost a domino effect of an unraveling. Are we near, not an Arab Spring, but a war crisis where we get a domino effect of food crises? We have to get on top of the food crisis. We need to front it right now. And we can. We have learned lessons about it. We know how to do it. Uh, but even if we front it, more countries would be in trouble. Why? Because in 2020, everybody had to borrow more to sustain an economy in standstill. Mm -hmm. Largest increase in debt because yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah. 
in 21, servicing this debt was easy. It was actually cheaper in some mm -hmm. places because interest rates were so low or negative. 2022, no more. With tightening of financial conditions, servicing right. debt is getting more expensive. Now, good news, not so good news. Good news is that we see that, we follow it, and we are already zeroing in on, on the countries uh, that are in need of debt restructuring. We have to press for debt well, restructuring. Well, you have Sri Lanka on Monday, right? This? They're coming into Dulles, and the, they're going to they, come in here, and you're going to sit with Sri Lanka. We what, would how sit do you with Sri Lanka. That? We would sit with Egypt. We would sit with Tunisia, and we would discuss with mm -hmm. them realistically what needs to be done. One, one thing that I saw, Sri Lanka has appointed very prominent Sri Lankan economists to be advisors. That right. gives me hope that they're okay. saying, OK, we have to Again, because of time, I've got to move on. Yeah. Everybody in G7 is focused on this, except Mr. Macron. He's got to get reelected, so we'll give him a, a, a pass mm -hmm. right now. What do you need from G7 to affect at maximum IMF uh, tactics and issues in this crisis? We need from G7 support for deploying the full set of instruments of the IMF fast. And we need space to build it for the future. Yesterday, our board approved a new instrument. First time in the history of the IMF, we have a long-term financing mm -hmm. instrument specifically for pandemic preparedness and for climate action. What we want is to think of building that resilience I talked about right. in a more comprehensive way. Tom, before when IMF says resilience, we mean banking sector, financial stability. Now it's broader. Now it is broader. We have to have people that are healthy and educated. <clears throat> we have to have right. the economy more, more vibrant. We have to have digital money integrated mm -hmm. today okay. in the way we would function tomorrow. You are a tough nut. The way you came up with some real struggle in Bulgaria, your academics and the work, and you've just got that certain manner of, you do this thing, and you're like, let's go, let's go, let's go. What do you say mm -hmm. to the IMF nations supporting Mr. Putin, whether it's direct, maybe it's somewhat indirect, think India, China, et cetera. How does the IMF address those nations that aren't on board helping Ukraine? Think of the interest of your people. Over the last decades of integrated global economy, we have tripled the size of global GDP, tripled. Who benefited the most? Emerging markets, developing economies. Their size increased mm -hmm four and a half times. Their poor, poor people are fewer. Their, their middle class has expanded. An integrated economy in which we can work together benefits you. Kristalina Gorgieva, thank you so much for joining us. What a wonderful start to the spring meeting. She is the IMF Managing Director, joining Bloomberg on radio and television. Back to you. Tom. Thank you so much for bringing us that interview. Let's go to check on the markets here in New York. We're about an hour into the U.S. trading session. We have a little bit of red on the screen. Extremely risk-off day when you think about it. And remember, this is coming ahead of a long weekend, so it's pretty natural to see some of that cash taken out of the table guy. But we also have to keep in mind a lot of what's going on in the S&P 500 right now has a lot to do with what's going on in the bond market. Stick with me here. You can see a lot of the pain concentrated in tech. The Nasdaq 100 really taking it on the chin here, down 1%, reversing the gains of yesterday. And once again, a lot of that comes down to the bond market. I'm going to skip to the uh, bottom here. The 10-year yield up a whopping eight basis points. And remember, Guy, it's all about the margin of the move, uh, not just yield higher, tech lower. It's about when you see these big spikes, as much as eight basis points that we're seeing right now, that's really when you get the bigger moves in the downside when it comes to the stock market. Speaking of the bond market, we also have to address what's going on here with the euro. And of course, that was lower. The two-year yield higher. And this is really interesting because in Europe, we talked about markets kind of interpreting Christine Lagarde as a dovish tilt. The two-year yield here in the state, it's all about the Fed and actually talking about a more aggressive approach. John Williams in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Mike McKee talking about 50 basis points, 100 percent on the table. Remember, he's also the second in command of the committee that helps make those decisions. And you can see immediately uh, the two-year yield seeing a little bit of a spike. We should also talk simply about what is actually moving when it comes to a micro basis. Bank earnings, Twitter, these are 
are all uh, going to be big movers when you talk about the individual stories. Bank earnings, remember, has everything to do with the consumer. And we've heard a mixed picture. Trading looks great, but loan loss provisions, a lot of preparation for what might be a recession in the coming years. And you can really see that commentary slowly trickle out. But really, it's that trading revenue that's pushing these enormous beats. And we have to talk about Twitter here because that bid, a $43 billion deal when Elon Musk potentially taking over Twitter, those uh, that offer under review right now, really fueling Twitter shares up 2.2%. But Guy, in pre-market this morning, it was up as much as 15%. Really, I think the story, though, when it comes to the U.S. corporate space is going to be those earnings. Why is Twitter trading below the offer price is something I think we're going to have to spend more time discussing. But as you say, Critty, it's macro versus micro today. The earnings story, as you say, absolutely front and centre, as ever kicked off effectively by the banking sector. Yesterday, JP Morgan. Today, we get Citi, we get Wells, we get Goldman Sachs. What can we take away from the start of the earnings season that's going to be useful, that tells us things about what comes next? Let's try and figure that question out. Laurie Calvacina, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets, joins us now. Laurie, great to see you. The earnings season kicks off. The banks are starting to give us information about what is happening with the U.S. economy, the global economy and their businesses. What's the takeaway and what's the takeaway from what we've got thus far for the rest of the earnings season? Well, thanks for having me as always. And, you know, it's an interesting day as usual. Um, look, I think that the banks always kick things off. We always spend a lot of time focusing on the banks. And so far, you know, I think what we're hearing from the banks about the health of the U.S. consumer is something, frankly, that I'm also hearing from consumer companies so far, um, which is that the, the sort of uh, rumors of the death of the consumer seem to be greatly exaggerated at this point. And that's not to say that there aren't real risks out there that we need to take seriously. But guy, I've been one client after another keeps asking me why the market is up versus the lows in March. And I, I keep telling people because I don't think the market is actually convinced yet that a recession is coming. The risks are real. The logic makes sense. But we are simply not seen evidence of a breakdown from corporate America yet. And I think the market is, is correct in, in sort of the levels that it's at right now. Lori, I'm very curious about what a lot of these companies are going to be doing with the enormous amount of cash on their balance sheets, not just the banks, but you have tech, for example, and of course, some of these other sectors that perhaps their stock has been under pressure in these last two years uh, relative to some of these big tech flyers, but they also have a lot of cash on their balance sheets. Talk to us a little bit about how they're going to deploy that cash in an inflationary environment. Well, look, I think that's a great question, Creedy. And we actually have been using the Bloomberg Transcript Analyzer tool. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a plug to see what companies have been talking about in regards to cash deployment um, in terms of things like buybacks, dividends, M&A, CapEx, et cetera. And what we've noticed is that coming into this reporting season, discussion about buybacks is on the upswing. Uh, discussion about dividends is on the upswing. We're also seeing that for CapEx. And I think that CapEx expanding capacity is one way that companies are trying to battle inflation, nearshoring is a theme we've been starting to read about a bit more. Um, at the same time, though, we're seeing fewer mentions of M&A, um, which is something investors always ask me about. Now, we're not seeing a big upswing in comments about debt pay down right now, but I wouldn't worry about that because we actually saw a lot of conversation about debt pay down in 2021, which yeah. is telling me that companies knew the Fed was starting to move and were getting ready for it by cleaning up their balance sheets. What are, what are companies trying to communicate by focusing on dividends and buybacks at this point, what are they trying to tell their investors about the types of companies they are? What do you think the message is? Well, look, I think that they are trying to emphasize that they are continuing to reward shareholders for investing in their companies. And on the dividend side specifically, we know that that is something a lot of retail investors, I'm thinking more of kind of the high net, net worth crowd as opposed to sort right. of the Reddit crowd, um, but, you know, that is something that retail investors typically do look to U.S. equities for. So I think they're trying to send a reassuring so, so, tone. Sorry, Laurie, that they, is that an yeah. inflationary hedge? Are they looking for the are they are they basically trying to communicate to their investors that they are an inflation hedge? I think so. And look, we do see that borne out over time. If you look at positioning in U.S. equities uh, relative to cash and bonds, it does tend to track CPI over time. So we do know that that's borne out in terms of behavior. And I think companies are trying to say, look, we're able to manage through these inflation pressures and still reward shareholders at the same time. So it's really at the end of the day, trying to send a message of confidence. 
Well, speaking of a message of confidence, uh, I I'm curious about the recession risk because we talk a lot about this, that perhaps uh, the United States, Europe more so, but the United States could see a recession down the road. But it doesn't seem like a lot of companies are necessarily that concerned about it from what I'm understanding. They're talking about a slowdown in growth. I guess the bigger question is, does that mean that they're going to start trying to pass on more of those costs to consumers and foresee that those consumers can't digest it. Talk to us a little bit about the margins picture. So, you know, if we just start with margins, we know that companies have been talking a lot about margin pressures in recent quarter, really for the past year and a half or so. Um, but the margins are far outperforming the commentary that we've seen um, because we are, again, seeing companies really emphasizing, hey, we've got all these pressures out there, but we're still able to manage through them. Pricing is one way they are managing through. And so we've actually seen a surge in commentary on pricing in recent co uh, call transcripts, earnings, and otherwise. And what we're noticing is that anal analysts on the sell side are really pushing companies to say, are, is the pricing strategy working? Are you getting pushback? And for the most part, companies are saying that they're still able to pass those prices through. Um, and look, I think the demand discussion is one that's of utmost importance. Um, we are generally seeing characterizations of demand as quite strong, not quite as strong as they were a few quarters ago, but still very, very strong. And I think as long as companies are still saying, hey, look, the demand is incredibly robust, the underlying appetite to spend both corporates and consumers is still robust. It's very, very hard for investors to say, hey, look, there's evidence of recession out there. Um, it's, this, this smells like something different if you really look at what the companies are talking about. Given that, given what you're saying about the recession, given what you're saying about what companies are saying, do you think the Fed's going to be comfortable with that? There is this fear that the Fed is looking at all of this and saying we're not getting the reaction, both from the corporate sector and also from the markets, that we need to see in order to drag down inflation back to levels that we're comfortable with, say sub 3%. Do you think the Fed is going to look at what is happening here with corporate America, what it's doing in terms of wages, what it's doing in terms of margins, and say, you know what, we need to go harder here? Well, look, I'm going to leave the, the sort of Fed calls to, to my esteemed economist, Tom Porcelli, but I was talking to him about this issue recently. And one of the things he told me was he said, look, you know, as we get later on in the year, if some of the data starts to look a little bit squishy and squishy, you know, was his quote, not mine. Um, but he said, I do think the Fed is going to sort of acknowledge that, you know, and I, I will say we did an investor survey recently, Guy, where we asked people about their faith in the Fed. And it's very, very low among investors right now. A big contingent of people who think they're going to tighten and, and go to too far and impinge on growth. And then there's another decent contingent who think they're going to continue to let inflation go out of control. Um, I would say maybe I have a little bit more faith in the Fed than either of those camps. And, and like Tom said, we'll continue to sort of look at the whole picture as the year progresses. Lori Calasina, head of U.S. Equity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets, we thank you so much for your time, your insight as always. Let's turn to one of the top movers of the day. Twitter shares higher as Elon Musk makes an unsolicited $43 billion bid for the social media company. For more, let's bring in Egal Aruni and Wedbush Securities Managing Director for Equity Research. Egal has a neutral rating on Twitter with a $42 price target. Egal, thank you so much for joining us. We're looking at Twitter shares right now, we're about hovering about $47. The bid, I believe, was for over $54. As Guy and I are both puzzled about, why is the stock so low? Hey, well, the stock's up materially from before Elon Musk uh, came into it. I think what, what the stock is telling us right now is that there's uncertainty whether the board accepts this offer or not. Um, it, it, it's not a given just because he offered, you know, $54 a share doesn't mean um, that the board's going to accept that. Um, and so there's, you know, some hedging around that price. And that's why, why we're, we're below it right now. Okay, let's just talk about the kind of the, 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 the question that underlies all of this. The offer is a take it or leave it. And maybe the stock's trading lower because maybe ultimately the market believes that the board says we're going to leave it and then, Trump, uh, and then um, Musk walks away and, and everything changes and the stock goes down. And I'm wondering whether that's the scenario that's ultimately being priced in here. Do you believe that this is a take it or leave it issue? So there, there's a couple of things in there. First of all, on that take it or leave it point, Maybe, maybe not. I, I, you know, could be a negotiating tactic. You know, Elon Musk is, uh, you know, has no one to change his mind, and just because he kind of put it out there that this is a take it or leave it offer, doesn't necessarily mean that that that's the case. Um, you know, Elon's coming at this from the point of view of you know, Twitter needs to be better about free speech, and it plays a really important role in society. Yeah. And 
you know, his view that Twitter and its management and the board hasn't, hasn't done that justice over time. So if that's really what he's going after here, um, giving an, a higher offer and thinking about valuation with the right prices, um, I don't think that that shouldn't be what it's about, right? It's, it's about him taking control and doing this to whatever he believes the, the role it should play in, in society. So no, I don't think just because he said that it's the final offer necessarily means that it is. Um, you know, what happens to the stock if he does walk away and, and ends up exiting a stake? Um, you know, there's probably some volatility and, and, and some downside there. Um, it puts more pressure on Twitter, uh, its board and its CEO to, um, you know, to put up the kind of results that will, will make investors confident in the story um, that, you know, its user growth and its revenue growth are on track to meet the targets that they've set. Um, so it definitely puts a higher hurdle, especially where the stock is today versus where it was just a few weeks ago. You know, one of the interesting narratives, I think, in the last couple of years uh, what, when it comes to Twitter was what might happen to Twitter when President Trump left office. And we know, of course, President Trump was very active on the platform. I'm curious what happens to Twitter shares if for some reason Elon Musk, as you pointed out, could potentially leave this offer and, and this, tw this deal could not go through. But Elon Musk is perhaps equally or even more active than President Trump on Twitter. Does that eat into the brand value of Twitter? You're asking if Elon Musk leaves leaves the platform and stops using Twitter as a, you know, as, as a platform himself, or if he, you know, simply doesn't choose to go through with the deal. Um, really, any of those circumstances. The idea here that Elon Musk perhaps not as active on Twitter as a as a board member or even as an active participant. So, look, I, I think what Elon brings to the table for for Twitter, um, which makes sense in, in his strategy here is more valuable in a private environment than it is in a public environment. Uh, what public market investors will value in, in, in Twitter, I think are different than what Elon Musk is valuing in Twitter, right? It, for, for, for investors, it's about user growth. Uh, it's largely really about user growth, but it's about monetization of those users where, where Twitter fits in the you know, uh, digital advertising and social media landscape. Um, and it's about you know, the, the numbers, right? That's, that, that's the brass task for uh, for, for, for public market investors. So if he leaves, I'm not sure that, or if he, if he would have joined, I'm not sure what the value would have been that he would have brought to the table there from the public market investor side. Um, in terms of whether he, you know, if he backs away and sells the stake and doesn't use Twitter as a platform anymore, I think Twitter is bigger than, than any one individual user. Um, yeah, obviously, yep. Elon Musk is a big personality, but I think there's so much more to it than that. You wonder what the future of President Trump on Twitter would be post uh, an Elon Musk takeover. That's an interesting question. We'll park that for, for, for a moment. Um, Egal, let's talk a little bit about Twitter versus Tesla. This is a very big check that potentially Elon Musk is about to write. Is this a zero-sum game? Is he ultimately, if he wants Twitter, he has to sell some Tesla? Yeah, I mean, it, maybe if he, if he puts up the whole thing himself. He would likely, you know, partner with a consortium, bring in some private equity and other investors with him. Um, I think that's the most likely scenario that, you know, he teams up with others. He, he will be the largest shareholder. I'm sure he'll put more, uh, you know, than, than the 9% the stake he has right now. Uh, my guess is there will be others that come along for the ride with him. Igor, great to catch up. Thanks for the analysis. Really appreciate it. Such a fascinating day. We've been kind of building up to this over the last few uh, weeks, haven't we? Igor Arunian of Webbush Securities. Thank you very much indeed, sir. What are we going to talk about next? We're going to take you back to the earnings season. Wells Fargo's analyst call currently underway. Uh, we've just been hearing from CEO Charlie Scharf. He's talking about wage pressures. He's actually talking about them coming down a little bit, talking about them maybe being not as great as they were in the fourth quarter. We're going to bring you the highlights from all the results we've seen today and we've got what we're getting on these calls. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Julian Emanuel of Evercore ISI. He's joining Bloomberg Markets for the close at 3.30 p.m. in New York. This is Bloomberg.
A huge day for Wall Street earnings. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citi, and Wells Fargo all out with results, results excuse me, earlier today. Trading was better than expected in the quarter. The Wells Fargo analyst call is underway, and Cities will start in about 10 minutes. Bloomberg Wall Street reporter Shanali Basak has been on the calls. She joins us now. I think one of the key takeaways from these results is going to be these enormous beats on trading revenue, essentially a winning streak that hasn't quite quit yet. I think it's fair to also assume that a lot of this is coming off simply the elevated volatility that we've seen. But Shanali, I'm looking at a VIX handle of 21, which is pretty close to our post-pandemic normal. What yeah. happens when the volatility goes away? And we've talked about this, that volatility could have been very stifling, but there are certain businesses that really blew through the roof here. We have Goldman Sachs, which posted not just a beat, but a significant rise in fixed income trading, currencies, commodities, helped by that volatile rates and commodities environment. We also saw Morgan Stanley fall just in line about where they were last year. That's more than $2.9 billion for Morgan Stanley in FIC trading revenues, which is higher and higher than the historical that we've seen from Morgan Stanley before, really uh, inking more than $2 billion there. Even Citigroup, even with a slight decline in the fifth business, you did have them beat expectations. And equities also, you had equities. Morgan Stanley taking the lead again here with more than $3 billion, more than three, almost $3.2 billion worth of equity trading revenue in a very tough environment, Critty. Um, these banks used to make a lot of money in Russia. They're not going to make that money yeah. going forward. Shinali, what have we learned about the exit from the Russian market? Yeah, this is a great question because we're finally seeing how these losses are being contained. Citigroup, we knew, was the most exposed here, and we know now that their exposure has dropped by about $2 billion to about $7.8 billion, Guy. And they still have loans. They still have a counterparty exposure and derivatives. But with that said, it is much more contained, and we know that it's about a billion dollars worth of Russia exposure alone when it comes to Citigroup's uh, provisioning here. Another $9 billion, uh, $900 million, I'm sorry. Uh, when it pertains to other risks surrounding the uncertainties of the uh, Ukrainian invasion here. Shelley, there's a massive debate. Are we in it for a recession? Is that on the horizon? Or are we simply in a slowing growth, demand destruction kind of environment? Where do the banks stand on that? We know Jamie Dimon has been extremely vocal, saying the consumer is fine, the economy is fine. What do the rest of the banks say? Not only do you have Jamie Dimon saying that the risk is still very low of the recession, or you know, rather his CFO saying that, you also have David Solomon today really starting off his call here with a list of risks. One of them, and he mentioned a couple times at the beginning of this call, this ex risk of accelerating deglobalization here. And he said that plus the inflation impact, the risk of rising rates, all of this could be uh, meaningful, is what he said for markets. With that said, the backlogs, Goldman, Morgan, Morgan Stanley are still robust, are still very stable. And it seems yep. here from the bankers that it, clients are simply prolonging activity here in equity, debt, and M&A markets. And you saw that a little bit today, guys, from that more, uh, Elon Musk deal. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So let's talk about the Outlook for Advisory. What is it? It's, it's Musk represented by Morgan Stanley. Goldman's representing Twitter. Like, what are they talking about, aside from that, in terms of the Outlook for Advisory? It clearly is slowing down. We were talking to Laurie Calvacina a little bit earlier on. She was saying that the one thing that, that they're getting as they screen all the earnings calls is that the, the talk of M&A has gone down and gone down dramatically. I think there's two things to remember here, Guy, and it's that as equity vol uh, volatility, as it stabilizes a little bit, and if valuations are suppressed, that gives some opportunity for private equity to start showing up in a bigger way and deploying capital after record fundraising. The other thing here is that you see billionaire-led deals. You see it in the Benettons. You see it in Elon Musk. Elon Musk, by the way, has counted Morgan Stanley as a banker before. They have hired them to do many a jumbo loan for Elon Musk's mortgages here. So you see see here the banks as they're catering to their wealthy individuals, as they're catering to their corporate clients, they are finding chances for big deals in between. Shanali, very quickly, you mentioned fundraising in particular. We talked about the advisory business. Talk to us about the ECM, DCM businesses. Well, the ECM, that IPO activity was a record last year, and it really started to fall off at the beginning of this year. Again, it's one thing for the investors really to say that this is something where they're prolonging equity raising activity. But the M&A, Goldman still, I, I have to say, Goldman Sachs still bought in more than a billion dollars worth of advisory fees alone. And Morgan Stanley saw their fees more than double in the advisory business. So underwriting is really what's going to have to come back in a bigger way here. Shanali's going to keep track of these calls. She'll be back a little bit later to update us on what we're learning. Bloomberg Shanali Basak, thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg.